So we need to teach math in the gym. Like literally, like we need to do math class in the gymnasium. And I'm not talking about like low, low quality math class. I'm talking about running around, throwing things, fire spinning math class. Are we down? You want this? All right. Actually, maybe I shouldn't be telling you to spin fire at school. Uh, so maybe we'll make it look like this. Is that OK? Yeah. yeah. OK, cool. So I'm a physicist. And I cool matter down to temperatures colder than interstellar space so that I can uncover the secrets of the universe. I am also a professional circus performer. I have found, or actually, so uh, based on what you've heard so far, you probably are thinking that I'm going to go along this line where I'm going to say physics and math and movement and art all come together to create this beautiful future where we're all excellent at everything, right? It's probably what I'm going to say. Yeah, OK. Actually, what I want you to know is that math and physics and movement and art all come from our human interaction with the infinite universe. It is us who break those things into different segments and into different categories. They are all actually part of our human experience. If we are able to break things down, we're able to learn them more easily. So uh, for example, have any of you ever heard of juggling? Yeah. 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 OK. Uh, you might know that it starts with throwing, right? And it also involves catching. Exactly. But then when we do that a lot of times in a row, maybe with three things, we call it juggling. A lot of people perceive themselves to be good or bad at math. Can you raise your hand if you're bad at math? Ooh, OK. Can you raise your hand if you're good at math? Awesome. So the reason that I wanted to emphasize that uh, juggling can be broken up into skills is that math is also broken up into skills. Math is actually not just one big single body of knowledge that you have to understand everything or nothing, and that means you're good at it or bad at it. Math is a bunch of individual skills, and skills are learnable. And as a physicist and as a professional circus performer, I want you to know that I believe that you have the potential to be more skillful than you can imagine. I'm from a small town in Ohio. and. Unlike, uh, apparently, all of the speakers who have spoken today, I was not a great high school student. And I mean, like, really not a great high school student. <laughs> uh, and actually, I did, we can take that picture off. There we go. Uh, I was such a bad high school student that I got detentions like all the time. I got a detention one day for skipping school, and I skipped school later, later that day and got another detention for it. Uh, I got suspended. I got expe almost expelled. Uh, when I turned 18, I was told to move out of my parents' house because I was completely out of control. I lived in an apartment and worked at a fast food restaurant while I tried to stay motivated about graduating high school. That felt really cool at the time, but it was exceptionally difficult. Once I did graduate, which felt like a huge success, I did what any reasonable person would do. I got rid of all of my stuff, I got into a van, and I ran off to join the circus. <laughs> I then spent a number of years traveling around North America, learning everything that I could about juggling and stilt walking. Oh, I think I got a stilt walking. There we go. Juggling and stilt walking and acrobatics and uh, fire dancing. And that was totally awesome. I mean, like, totally awesome. Like, absolutely do that if you can. But uh, my family did not think that was awesome. And my mom uh, wanted to con or did convince me that I should try college. So I applied to the Ohio State University. I got in. And now I had to pick like what was my major going to be. Uh, I came to find out that physicists are a really quirky, rebellious group of people. 
A good physicist has absolutely no respect for authority. <laughs> Physicists also, well, and, and also that's because physicists respect reason, right? That's why it's okay to not respect authority. Uh, physicists also live in a world filled with curiosity and inquiry. And I am totally down with that, so I decided to major in physics. That meant I had to take a lot of math classes. As I got into multivariable calculus, I discovered that these two guys, Leibniz and Newton, simultaneously and independently invented calculus with the intention of logically expressing their understanding of the real physical changing world. Well, running around learning circus tricks for a bunch of years taught me a lot about the real physical changing world. And what I discovered was that what I was doing with my body was the same thing that we were doing in math class. And even more, I realized that if other people could understand that connection between what's going on in their life in the real world and what's going on in math class, that the number of people who are good at math is larger than the number of people who think that they are good at math. Can I get, have everybody stand? Actually, wait. Don't stand up yet. <laughs> As I learned math, I realized that math is all about patterns. And it's about expressing those patterns logically. As I kept learning other things and taking my general education classes, I realized that there's a lot of other stuff that's all about patterns. Like juggling, of course. But also, sociology, and biology, and gender, and experimental nuclear physics. And all of those things are about patterns and logical ways of expressing those patterns. What I came to discover was that if you are able to understand patterns and you are able to do some logic, then you are capable of doing many things well, including mathematics. And you have the potential to be more capable than you can imagine. Can everybody stand up now? All right, can you raise your right hand, put it over to your left side, make a fist, and then bring that fist down to your knee, to your left knee. Left hand up, make a fist, bring it down to your right knee. Right hand, down, left hand, down. Now flex really strong, like, like you're pulling something down from heaven. Oh, we're pulling the clouds down. Yeah, there we go. Pull them down. All right, now both arms up, hands together. Bring it in tight, down to your knees, and back up. OK, you can see. Take a seat. Believe it or not, actually, can you feel how your body uh, feels right now? Like, just feel yourself, just like, you know, sense, and feel how your brain feels now? You are more ready to learn right now than you were one minute ago because movement creates chemicals in your brain which prepare it to learn and grow. And there's a great book about this by John Rady from the Harvard Medical School where he researched a high school district in Illinois where the students had the opportunity to take a physical education class before the school day started. And they found that those students on average had their grades go up in their first period classes. And his explanation of this was that Actually, I was going to tell you his explanation, but I want to modify it a little bit, so I apologize to Dr. Rady if uh, he ends up watching this. What I, want, what I want his quote to say is that <laughs> I'm only changing a few words. Only a few. It's like, I think it's fair. <laughs> physical activity not only helps with your physical health, but it helps you regulate your moods and your attention and prepares your brain to be ready to take in new information. We should be teaching math in the gym because people are better learners when they move. And it makes you wonder if that's like possibly why they call high school in Germany the gymnasium. It's probably not why. <laughs> All right, so um, have you ever wondered like 
why did these ridiculous maniacs ever come up with math in the first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like what the heck? <laughs> you have to learn this every year from six years old to 18 years old, or in my case, for my entire life, apparently. Uh, yeah, like why did they do that to us? Well, what they were doing was looking at the physical world and trying to figure out ways to explain what they were observing in a logical way. And the results of their labor are things like time and music and crafts. And when we put some math and, uh, and the physical world back together, then we get things like technology and buildings. And if we extend it out beyond places where we can only imagine, places we've never been, we start to understand the structure of the solar system, the structure of our galaxy and our, of our entire universe. Well, not the entire universe. Let's just take a moment to appreciate the universe is really big. <laughs> and uh, if you already know something about converting minutes to seconds, or playing an instrument, or stacking blocks so that they don't fall over, you actually already know stuff about math. You're already knowledgeable, and you have the potential to be more knowledgeable than you can imagine. So when math is taught in this way, where it's related to our physical environment, and it is, uh, then it is meaningful and it is uh, relevant, right? When, oh, no, we're, we're skipping that one. And we're going to go back. There we go. Uh, when math is taught as something that you just have to sit there and like do on a page because your teacher told you to, it's like almost certainly stressful and it's very likely boring. Can I get a hand up if you think that there should be no such thing as boring mathematics? Yeah, yeah. Well, it turns out the circus is totally not boring. <laughs> so this is how I've been addressing this problem. Uh, I'm not ready to take this off just yet. Um, I teach a class where we do 30 minutes of movement, and then we do 30 minutes of math. And when we're doing the math, we do it at computers, where we uh, learn trigonometry and computer programming. And the math is related to the movements that we're doing. Then we go back and we do 30 minutes of movement. And then we do 30 minutes of math. And then we just repeat that endlessly until we die. <laughs> I want to give you a little sample. This object is called a poi. And it's basically just a, a ball on the end of a string. And it comes to us from the Maori people of New Zealand. So what we do in class is we start by doing something with this. For example, you can spin it in a circle. Everybody see the circle? Yeah. All right. Uh, where is that circle? Oh, yeah, it's in your mind, right? Just like every geometric object. It's only in your mind. What you are doing is noticing patterns. OK, let's try. And, and then after we look at those patterns with our bodies, we look at the equations. Am I awkward enough? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the ways that you can express a circle using math. It's not my favorite way, but it's one of the ways. Then we do something different with our bodies. What am I doing now? Oh, man, I can't sneak anything past you. Guess what? Then we look at the equation of the bigger circle. <laughs> then we do something different with our bodies. <laughs> then we look at the equation of it. And so I've been teaching this class. And what I find is that even people who think about themselves as being kinesthetic learners, as being not good at math, as being dancers or athletes or you know, whatever it is physical that you might identify with, even these people remain engaged throughout class. And I have seen them at the end of class asking their parents to wait while they finish one more problem. And I'm not saying like we do simple stuff. This is the type of thing that we're working on. So this is an actual pattern that we can do with our bodies. And this is a code that a student wrote. And it blows my mind to see them that engaged with the physical activity and doing the math. 
And what I've discovered is that the number of people who are good at math is larger than the number of people who think that they are good at math. As I've been doing this, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, this POI artist. His name is Ben Drexler. And when we first met, he did not think that he was good at math, but he was really into POI. So we worked through the mathematics of POI over a number of years, and he did a lot of work on his own. And now he believes he is good at math, which is true. I think everybody's good at math. He's also often referred to as the POI mathematician. And the reason I wanted to emphasize his story is that he didn't just learn it. He now is going out into the world and sharing it with other people. And he's keeping them engaged in their bodies, and he's keeping them engaged with their minds. And so if you remember uh, when I started this tale, I told you about uh, me being an excellent high school student. Um, you know, I, oh yeah, and I, I guess I didn't finish that story. Uh, I also then went on to Ohio State University. I g went through a lot of honors classes. Uh, I graduated with a straight A's uh, in physics, and now I have a PhD in experimental nuclear physics. So if you were worried that story worked out, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that I learned that I was more skillful, more capable, and more knowledgeable than I could have imagined, especially when I was your age. And what I want you to do is to feel that about yourself. You have more potential than you can imagine. And I want you to feel that about other people. They are more skillful, more capable, and more knowledgeable than they can imagine. And I want you to encourage that in them. I hope that I've shown you how the history of mathematics kind of results in uh, observing the physical world, or, or we, we started with observing the physical world, and then we figured out how to express it mathematically. And that is what I think we should do with classes, is they should be focused on the physical world. But what I want to show you is what I think the future of math class should look like. Thank you.